2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, and one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up and nourished up. And it grew up, they grew up together with him and his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take uh, of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man uh, that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover given unto thee such and such things." Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, and hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hath taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon? Now therefore the sword shall not depart out of thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken a wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you be with me this morning as I stand before your congregation to preach your word. I pray that I can preach in a way that's pleasing unto you and in a way that folks can understand it. Lord, I pray that you'd reach into the hearts of each and every person here, Lord, and I pray that you'd show us, Lord, that we need to always be in the conflict. We need to always be wary, Lord, because the old nature would have us to go backwards instead of pressing forward for thee. And Lord, I do pray also if someone here is lost, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. It's in Christ Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Now primarily this morning I'm going to preach to the Christian. But no doubt there may be a lost person in here and we will try to put a hook in you there too and show you that there is a Savior who would save you from your sins. If you're lost today, you can always come down to this old-fashioned altar and put your faith in Christ Jesus alone and secure a place in heaven forever by faith. No doubt about it, but this morning I want to preach to Christians. Now, I believe David was a believer. As a believer in the Old Testament, he didn't know all the things that we knew in the New. He did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as we as New Testament believers do. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people and then it would depart. He would come upon people and it would depart. So we have a great advantage when it comes to standing against sin, don't we? But I'm afraid that we often fall away from God. And I don't mean in salvation. I'm talking about in fellowship. We get away from Him and we let temptation steer our paths away from fellowship with Him. And that's why I'm going to preach this morning on the traveler. Now, David knew the meaning of this parable, or this story that Nathan was telling. After it was revealed to him that he was the man, of course. I mean, after all, David listening to Nathan speak at the beginning, I can imagine he started getting very angry because he was a shepherd himself. No doubt he thought about all the sheep that he watched as he was a young lad and how he cared for them. So he really identified with this man who had this little ewe lamb. They grew up with him that he took care of and that he nourished. And then to hear that somebody came and took that ewe lamb away and slew it and fed it to the traveler really made him mad. I can imagine a vein popping out on his forehead and he says, this man's going to pay. But I can also see him fall backward as Nathan points his finger in David's face and says, you're the man. You're the man, David. You're the man that took the ewe lamb. Now it's obvious who uh, uh, each character represents in this story that Nathan tells. I mean, after all, the rich man is David. David looked upon Bathsheba, he lusted after her, and he took her. Just as the rich man took the ewe lamb. The poor man, of course, is Uriah. 
the Hittite. He had this one wife. He was poor. That's the only thing he had was his wife. But David took that wife away and had him killed. The little ewe lamb, of course, is Bathsheba in the story. She's the one who was taken from Uriah. When David had all these wives, uh, well, by the way, he shouldn't have had all them wives, but he had all these wives. But who is the traveler in the story? The other ones are obvious, but who is the traveler represent in this story that was told by Nathan the prophet? Today we're going to expose him. Now, uh, who was the problem in this story? Well, the problem in this story was the traveler. The traveler came. The traveler is the one who required a meal. The traveler no doubt had a hand in the slain of the little ewe lamb. The traveler convinced a man after his own heart the sweet psalmist to do a terrible, terrible thing. One day, uh, David rode into the gate of the city. He walked through the marble halls of his palace. He took off his armor when he should have been doing battle. Let me stop right here a moment. He should have been doing battle. He takes his armor off. Isn't that like many Christians today? We're in a warfare, folks. This world is, is going to hell, folks. This world is turning its back on God. And this world is turning away from the precepts of God's book. And we are taking our armor off and we're just letting them have it. David should have been fighting, but yet he was there at the palace. But he walked out on the balcony and guess who was there on the balcony with him? The traveler was. The traveler was there. I can imagine the traveler saying to David, look down at that. Well, she sure is beautiful, isn't she? And David lends his ear to the traveler. Maybe the Spirit of God moved upon David and the Spirit of God said, uh, don't do it, it's not right. Don't look upon her in that way. The Spirit of God said, walk down from the balcony. Get out of, the, get out of that side of that lady. She's not yours. But the traveler speaks up again and says, uh, you, you must have her. And I can imagine, once again, the Spirit of God speaking to David saying, This is wrong. You're a man after God's own heart. She's not your wife. You have your own wife. But once again, the traveler speaks up and says, Take her. And pretty soon, you know what David says? He says, I want her. Shortly thereafter, an adulterer was sitting on the throne in Israel. The ewe lamb had been taken and had been violated. All while the rich man was away fighting, I mean all, along, all while the poor man was out fighting the rich man's war. Why? Because the traveler came. Now we need to be wary. And the reason I'm preaching on this traveler is because this traveler is still about. He's still walking to and fro. That's why he's called a traveler. He moves about all over the place. You say, who is he? Well, I'm going to identify him to you this morning. Now, uh, let's talk about the person of the traveler. Now, the Christian has three enemies. The first one's the devil. Say amen. I've told you before when the angel uh, puts chains upon uh, that old slew foot and drags him and casts him into the pit, I'm going to try to give a swift kick to his hinder parts. I hope the Lord lets me. Because the devil is a great enemy. But I don't think the traveler here is the devil. You say it had to be the devil. No, it didn't have to be the devil. You know, many people always give the devil the glory for everything that, that, that goes wrong in their lives. They say, the devil, if they do something bad, they say, the devil made me do it. There's an old TV show, I think it's Flip Wilson, he'd always say, the devil made me do it. The devil didn't make you do it. Do you realize this, that the population of the world is around 7.8 billion now we give attributes to the devil that don't belong to him. Only God is omnipresent, folks. Only God can be everywhere at one time. The devil can't be everywhere at one time. He's in one place all the time. I probably never faced the devil. You probably ain't never faced the devil either. Say amen. You must think a lot of yourself if you think the devil is actually after you personally. Now he does have henchmen. There are demons and no doubt I've probably had conflicts with, with devils and demons and all that sort. Uh, there, after all, there is a great spiritual uh, wicked kingdom around the devil. There's principalities and powers that we all have to wrestle against. But the devil himself 
I'm sure is probably somewhere fight somebody that's a lot more spiritual than we are. If you just have to admit to it. But the devil is not the traveler here. Now, the other, one of the other enemies we have is the, the world system. The world system is the enemy of the Christian also, as well as the devil. Our environment is trying to pull us away from God. The world is trying to lure us away from those sweet spiritual things that we should be enjoying. I think of Song of Solomon when, when the lady is talking about her beloved. And she's all uh, talking about her love. That's all she's all about. And all of a sudden the young maid said, come to us, come to us. That's the way it is with the world. When we start admiring the Savior and we start falling in love with Him, the world tries to pull us away. Tries to lure us away to other things that aren't as important. The world tries to infiltrate the church and make it more like itself. The world would have nothing more for, than this church to become just a social gathering where nobody's toes get stepped on, where the Word of God is not preached. Uh, the world loves churches like that. But you get a church where the preacher opens the Bible and preaches uh, with, with power. Uh, the world doesn't want that. I don't like that old-fashioned stuff. I don't like that the doctrine stuff. You know, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I mean, many years ago, I knocked on the door, and a woman opened the door, and I was talking about Jesus, telling her about being saved, and I told her about the church. She said, what kind of church is it? I said, it's a good church. She said, ain't one of them churches that preaches doctrine, is it? I said, What? Preaches doctrine. You know what doctrine is? The doctrine is this book. The doctrine is the Bible. The doctrine is what we know about God. Of course we preach the doctrine. But the world don't want nothing to do with that. It's an enemy of it. These are our enemies and they're getting worse and worse and worse. I tell you what, you must have had your head in a hole if you haven't seen how far spiritually we backed up in the last year. I mean, just look at what Congress just passed. They're trying to get a law passed that allows women into the, I mean, men in the women's bathrooms and women in the men's bathrooms. They want to do it all the way uh, with all that kind of stuff. They want women, to, men to play in women's sports. And what's wrong with us? That's the world we're in. We got worldly preachers out there telling everybody they're all right. But I tell you what we need to know is what sin is. We need to know where our faults are so we can fix them. How are we going to fix them if we don't know what they are? And how are we going to know what they are if a preacher doesn't preach the Bible to us? Got these guys out there telling you you can have all these material things if you'll give them a bunch of money. That's not in the Bible. That's not first century Christianity. That's not what happened in Acts. It doesn't speak in Acts chapter 2 about everybody bringing in a bunch of money and paying Peter and then him having them all brand new camels out in the parking lot. That ain't what happened. The Pentecost they preached with boldness. They lifted up the Lord Jesus Christ and souls got saved. We got these professors in colleges today turning people's, young people's hearts away from God. Teaching a lie. You say, what lie, preacher, are they teaching? They're teaching that men evolved by chance. That is garbage. Man didn't evolve whether by, by chance or by design. Man did not evolve. God formed man from the dust of the earth in his own image, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We got the world out there trying to pervert this world, and, this, and they're trying to pervert our children. We need to do like old Abraham when the fowls came down to devour the sacrifices he made unto God. He went out there and he shooed them away. Amen. As these worldlings come and try to teach false doctrine to our children, try to teach evolution, humanism to our children, we need to shoo them away. Get away, buzzard! Amen. But the world system, that is our enemy, but I don't believe that's who the traveler is either. Now we got the flesh, that's the third in them. We got the devil, the world, and the flesh. Now I'm telling you right now, the flesh is the one that's getting you to do all them things you shouldn't be doing. You've been giving all the credit to the devil, but the person you need to blame the most is the one you look at in the mirror, that old flesh. 
The old nature, Christian. When you got saved, God did not do away with the old nature. You still have that old nature still inside of your members. And He is trying to pull you away from God. The old man, He's trying to pull you away from spiritual things while the Holy Spirit that now lives inside of you tries to get you towards spiritual matters. We have two natures. They're always at conflict with one another. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, that's who the traveler is. The traveler was David's flesh. David went up on that balcony and his flesh said, go ahead and do it. David knew that he shouldn't look upon that lady down there in her nakedness. And he, he, he maybe even thought about turning away, but the flesh said, look on. He said, I can't do this thing, maybe like Joseph, but the flesh said, go ahead and do it like Amnon did. I mean, I, yeah, like Jonadab did to Amnon. Just go ahead and do it. If it'll feel good, you'll enjoy it, do it. That's who the traveler is, it's the flesh. You know, let me illustrate this. In the Vietnam War, I wish Bob was here so I could, I could talk to Bob here for a moment, but in the Vietnam War, Ho Chi Minh, I guess, was the head honcho on the enemy side in, the, in, the North, in, in, in Vietnam. Now, none of the soldiers, I believe, fought Ho Chi Minh directly, did they? Huh? They didn't, go, they didn't shoot their rifle at him. I'm sure they would have loved to have shot him, but none of them had to fight. Their enemy was the machine guns, the landmines, the enemy soldiers hidden in the jungle. The enemies that they faced every day is what they had to be concerned about and what they had to worry about. You know, uh, that's who we need to worry about too. The enemy we face every single day. You know, uh, you may face the world if you go out in your workplace. You might have some people there who try to lead you away from God. You may go to school and there's some people who try to lead you away from God there. But then you're going to get to come home. And leave them behind. But you know who's going to be there? The flesh. You've got to fight, fight the flesh all the time. The devil don't follow you around, but that flesh does. He's the traveler. That means he moves with you. Where you go, he is. It's not the devil Ho Chi Minh you really got to worry about. It's the battle you face every day by that old nature. And if you ever get to the point where you think you've arrived and you've become some great spiritual creature, that's when the flesh is going to get an occasion against you. You know who we face every day. It's not the devil. It's not the world. It's the flesh. It's the old nature. It's the traveler. The traveler was there on the rooftop with the rich man, David. The flesh rose up. And the man that beat the lion, grabbed it by the beard and smote it, fell to the traveler. You know, you may have had some great spiritual battles in your past. You may have made some strong stands. You may have been somebody for the Lord. But if you ain't careful, the traveler is going to take you out. This is the same man who, who whooped a bear. I know you learned that Davy Crockett whooped a bear when he was only three. I don't think that happened to you. But I know David whooped a bear. Not there in the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't lie. But this same man who killed a bear fell to the traveler. This man who stood up to the giant of Gath, the great Goliath, the man of war from his youth, almost ten foot tall, David stood up to him in the name of the Lord and felled that great giant, but yet the traveler brought David down. I preached a sermon uh, last year uh, called uh, The Giant That Brought Down David. And there was a giant that brought down David and I named him something else in that sermon but today I name him the traveler. The traveler brought David down. The old nature. The one who uttered, is there not a cause? Who went and fought when everybody else wouldn't fight? Let himself down. He stood up for Israel but he let himself down. He let the flesh Take over. He wasn't deterred by the size of the giant, nor the scorn of his brothers. He wrote a great psalms. He was a man after God's own heart, but he fell to the traveler. And if David can fall to the traveler, so can you. 
So can you. Now let's move on. We get the person of the traveler. Let's talk about uh, the presence of the traveler. Now, we've touched on this a little bit already, but let's go back over it a little bit. In ver chapter 11, verse 1, we see it says, When kings went forth to battle. If David uh, wouldn't have been there, he may not have looked on Bathsheba and may not have committed that sin. If he'd have been in the battle. But you know what? The traveler is not only on the balcony... He's also on the battlefield. No matter where David was, the traveler was going to be there. The old nature was going to be there, pulling him away from God. However, the traveler would have been on that battlefield. He's always with you too, Christian. He's the traveler. The old nature's going with you no matter where you go. I mean, if you go to church, the traveler's there. You know he's right there with you right now. Your old flesh is there. And your flesh here in a little bit might be saying, man, it's all, it should be time to go by now. Right. That's the traveler. Yeah. Huh? You, the, the traveler is sitting there while Brother Badman is up there singing saying, I don't know about that guy. Right. That's the traveler. Right. I, don't know if I, I don't know if I was Brother Tim, I wouldn't have had him come. But that's the traveler. Right. It was the traveler that had you talking bad about the Sunday school teacher. Is the traveler uh, saying something about there being no piano player? That's the traveler. That's the old nature. He's always criticizing. He's always tearing down. But you don't need to listen to the traveler. You need to listen to the Spirit of God. Amen. That old preacher, he's hollering too much. That's the traveler. He goes with you to church. Isn't that bad? There's a fine lady. Visitor comes into the church. There you are lusting after in church. That's the traveler. His school, the traveler goes with you to school. You go to school, he's there. Sure, you got the world out there too. And I tell you what, the traveler does, likes nothing better than to, to nudge you in the rib and say, listen to those guys. Right. Travel say, look how much fun they're having. Listen to what they're talking about. They, they got drunk uh, last, uh, last Saturday. I tell you, listen to them. They're just having a good time. That's what the traveler likes to do. Right. Huh? Some bad joke gets told in your presence. The old traveler says, that's, that's funny, wasn't it? Get in there with him with it. He's with you at the schoolhouse. He's with you at work. I tell you what, I, 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 we're, I, well, I've seen the traveler at work plenty of times. Brother Bradman, we've seen the traveler, ain't we? Traveler's there. He's always trying to get the people of God to cow down or back up or join in with the crowd. And I sadly to say, uh, the traveler's got me a few times. Matter of fact, he's probably got me a bum more than what I even realize. And I tell you what, he'll get you too if you ain't careful. That old nature will have you acting just like the world. That old nature will have you uh, uh, being a contradiction. So you should be like Christ. But the traveler will have you be like the world. An old traveler, he likes to go out with single people on their dates. Right. Amen. There's an old biblical word. You might, uh, people need to learn it today. It's called fornication. Fornication is sex outside of marriage. That's a sin, folks. Amen. The old traveler likes that one. You ain't careful. He's going to have you doing things you ordinarily wouldn't do. That's why the traveler... He's called, that's why he's called to travel. He travels everywhere you go. Now wait a minute. He, he's not just on the balcony. He's also in the bathtub with Bathsheba. It wasn't just David who listened to the traveler. Uh, the ewe lamb did too. I don't know if she's in a bathtub or pulling, pouring water on her head. Or whatever she is doing. There was the traveler. It takes two people to have one of these kind of relationships, don't it? Kind of reminds me of that woman that was taken in adultery in Jesus' day. She was caught in the very act of adultery, but who was out there getting stoned? It was just her. Where was the, what happened to the fella? You women say amen. He should have been there too, shouldn't he? But I'm glad, the one I'm glad that was there was the Lord Jesus Christ though. That's the one that made all the difference. And that's the one that can forgive. But anyways, it takes two people. You might say, well preacher, he was the king so she had to listen to what the king uh, said. She had no, uh, no way to, to, to disregard what he said. Well, I, I, I beg to differ. She sure should have, could have. She could have said, David, 
You may be the king, but I'm not going to commit this evil act. Isn't that what Joseph said to Potiphar's wife? He said, how can I do this great evil against God? And what happened to him? He got thrown in jail by false accusation. She could have done that. She could have said, throw me in prison if you want to. She could have said, cut my head off. But I ain't doing it. She could have said, I serve a God that's more powerful than you, David. It couldn't she have done that? But no, she listened to the traveler too. There's plenty of blame to go around. And I tell you, that's what we like to do is blame somebody else, isn't it? We won't blame somebody else, but we have power to overcome the tra traveler, folks. When you've been born again, you've been given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is pow more powerful than the old nature. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. You can overcome the traveler. You don't have to give in to Him all the time. Now, I, I, know, I, I, know, I know that we fall and we fail. Nobody's perfect, but we like to throw that out as an excuse all the time. As we're doing stuff, we're saying, well, everybody falls. That's not an excuse. God don't give us an occasion to sin. He gives us an escape from sin. Amen. The traveler spoke to her. Maybe, maybe the traveler said, oh, David, he's handsome. Man, he's a, a man among men. He's the king too. He's got all this power. If you give in to him, maybe you can have a part of that power too. Maybe the traveler nudged her and said, well, your, your, your husband, your eye, the Hittite, he's just a footman in an army, but here's the king. He picked you out of all the men, all the women in all of Israel. He loved, he, he, he wanted to look at you. Traveler, sir, sir, staring up the flesh. Isn't that what the traveler does? You know, I remember one time it occurred to me, I was reading about the full armor of God. And I was reading about the, the, the shield of faith. Y'all know the shield of faith? What, what's it used for? To quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. The devil shoots those fiery darts at us, or the old flesh does. Either one. Shield of faith puts them out. But when those arrows get through, when we don't put up our shield of faith, that penetrates the skin. And what does the flaming arrow do? It inflames the flesh. And that's what the traveler does. He wants to inflame the flesh. He wants us to long after ungodly things. It talks about, uh, in, in, the, in the Bible, it talks about uh, two people. And they, they were lusting after one another. It says, let them be married lest they burn. Let them be married. Because if they don't get married, they'll continue to burn towards one another. That means have the desires towards one another that are unholy. But if they be married, that relationship becomes holy. The devil wants to, us to burn in our desires, our unholy desires. Outside of the confines of what God wants them to be. The traveler is a Trojan horse. Amen? He comes in our own body. And he fights against us to try to pull us away from God. Every one of us has a powder keg inside of us ready to explode at the slightest spark of temptation. And don't ever think yourself to be so spiritual that you can't explode and do something you'll regret. Because the traveler is going to continue to whisper in your ear every single day of your life. He's going to dog your trail no matter where you go, no matter what spiritual height you attain to. The traveler is going to be there trying to pull you back down to the earth. I've heard the illustration, I'm sure you have too, so I won't use go into too, in too much detail with it. But everybody's heard the illustration of the two dogs. Y'all heard that? You got two dogs. Let's just uh, let's, let's say you got a black dog and a white dog. Barley's going to make a joke about me after church for that. But anyways, here you go. You got a, uh, the black dog represents sin, the white one, the holiness. And here you have these two dogs. Well, those two dogs represent the two natures. You feed uh, the white dog a whole lot, it gets bigger and it gets stronger, you don't feed the black one, who's going to win the fight? Huh? The white one's going to win the fight, isn't it? Because it's going to be fed, it's going to be nourished. I tell you, you do the opposite. Don't feed uh, uh, the white one and feed the black one. Which one's going to get stronger and bigger? The black one is. Who's going to win the fight? Well, we got the two natures. Which one you feed is going to determine who wins. Amen. Amen. Think about Romans chapter 7. Paul tells of his struggle against the old nature. You know Paul struggled against the old nature? 
The old traveler followed Paul around. Here he is going around the whole known world, all of Asia, and there's the traveler dogging his trail all along the way. And then Paul says, sometimes that traveler he gets me. Amen. He said, the things I would do, I do not, and the things I wouldn't do, those are the things that I do. Why? Because the traveler had an influence in his life. The old nature. You know, a Christian can uh, a Christian has the Holy Spirit inside. They're in a conflict all the time. The Spirit of God against the old nature. But when we give in to that old nature, you know what we do? We grieve the Holy Spirit. We lessen His voice in our life. We don't feed uh, that one dog, in other words. Get weak spirits. That's how we get took down. All right, let's move on. We got the person of the traveler. That's the old nature, the flesh. We got the presence of the traveler. He goes with you everywhere you go. And then we got the plan of the traveler. Now, what's the plan of the traveler? Well, the plan of the traveler is this he wants to please himself. That's all the traveler's worried about is himself. At the, he wants to please himself at the expense of obedience to God. He wants to be fed so he can be stronger, he wants to be fed so he can pull you away from God. The results of uh, the, the, the listening to the travel is the ruining of your testimony. You know, one of the most important things, you know, now salvation is the, the most important thing anybody can ever have. You say amen? I mean, you can belong to the most exclusive of clubs, uh, but if you're not a child of God, you're going to hell when you die. Most valuable things to know Jesus Christ. Nothing better. But another valuable thing you own is your testimony. Your testimony, and I told you, it's so fragile, your testimony. It can be destroyed in an instant. It takes year after year to build this testimony, but then it can be gone in an instant. If you go to the wrong place, or you lose your self-control for a moment, you can lose your testimony, and that's a terrible thing. And every one of us in here is in danger of losing that testimony at any moment. All it takes is to have the traveler whisper in your ear and you say yes sir he wants to spoil your joy you know there's nothing more miserable than a backslidden Christian there's nothing more joyful than to be a Christian in the center of God's will but when you let the traveler rule in your life the old nature that joy dissipates and disappears see happiness is being a, a glad from outward circumstances but joy wells up from the inside and if the old nature's ruling in your inside parts, you're going to be miserable. Right. He likes to separate you from the fellowship you should have with God too. You know, as Christians, we can't lose salvation. Once you have it, you have it forever. Can I hear say get some amens on that? Amen. Some people don't believe that. Well, when they don't believe that, they don't believe the Bible. The Bible says, I shall give them eternal life and they shall never perish. I think about John 3, 16, the brother sang about, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. That means forever. But the traveler, he, he can't have your soul in hell, but he'll, he'll have you lose fellowship with God. Losing that joy, losing that effectiveness. You know, they talk about people losing their purpose. They talk about a person retiring and they, they don't go to their job anymore and they, they can't find a hobby or something to do and they, they lose their purpose and a lot of times people go downhill from that point. They don't have their purpose. A Christian, you've got a purpose. Let God use you. Don't listen to the traveler. You know, I, I, I noticed something Brother Bob uh, put it on Facebook about prayers. You know, if you've backslidden away from God, God can shut His ears to you. Your sin can hide His face from you. Now, now, yeah, I'm speaking the truth. Even in Peter, it says if you have a bad relationship with your spouse, it can hinder your prayers. That's what it says. You're going to let the traveler talk you into to, to not having the power of prayer? Prayer is the most powerful thing as Christians we have. To communicate with the Most High. To communicate with the all-powerful God up in heaven who loves us and wants to give to us uh, to uh, cut that off because what the traveler says, what a foolish thing. 
It's like the little baby uh, boy, a uh, little toddler. He, he was there and he had a maid. They had a maid and the maid was watching the toddler while the rich uh, woman was sitting there in her den or whatever. And she heard the baby wanting something. Eh, eh, eh. She said, I ain't fooling that baby. That's why I have uh, the maid in there. So she said to the maid, Maid, give her, that baby whatever it wants so to shut up. Pretty soon, you know what, the baby started screaming. And the lady said, what happened? The maid said, I give her what, what, what she wanted. You know what she wanted? It was a, a, a wasp come into the, the house. All this bright yellow and black. A body is flying around. That's what that baby wanted. And she got it. And she wouldn't, the baby wasn't glad that it got it, was it? But that we're like that. We won't sin. No one that will sting us. No one at the last that biteth like an adder and stingeth like a viper. We won't sin. We won't sin. But what happens? It bites us. David wanted Bathsheba. And what happened? He got the sting. He got Bathsheba. He got a moment with her. He got a little bit of time with her. But I tell you what, he paid for it the rest of his life. The sword did not depart from his house just like Nathan the prophet said it would. Sin will, sin will make you pay in the end. I like what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. They're seasonal. Don't listen to the traveler. So what do we need to do? How are we going to fight the traveler? If he's as powerful as what I say, and he goes with you everywhere you go, what, what, what do you need to do to overcome the traveler? Well, I'm going to just be blunt with you. You just need to kill the traveler. Amen. Kill the traveler. The Bible says to mortify the deeds of the flesh. The word mortify means to kill them. Amen. Kill them. Die to them. And you wake up in the morning, die unto sin, die unto yourself, and live for Christ. I'm not talking some foolish stuff like Jim Jones and kill yourself. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about kill the old nature. Do away with him. Now, when you kill him, you know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to kill him again. You know what's going to happen after you kill him again? He's going to rise right back up again. You're going to have to just keep on killing him. You're going to have to become a spiritual killer, Christian. Constantly killing the traveler, the old nature. Dying to yourself. Jesus, speaking of himself, says, Unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Of course, he's talking about himself dying on the cross of Calvary so he could save us and bring us in to his kingdom. But I tell you, there's a great application in that. We need to die that we can bring forth fruit. Spiritual fruit. Kill the traveler. When, when he wakes up, kill him. When he resurrects to try to tempt you again, kill him. Listen to Galatians 5, 24. It says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and have, uh, with the affl afflictions and lusts. We need to crucify the flesh along with the lusts. So go with it. Crucify the traveler. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verse 12. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, that's the flesh, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In other words, you don't have to listen to the traveler. You've been given victory over him. That's why the Bible says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Who can we conquer? We can conquer the old traveler, the old flesh, the old nature. You don't have to give in to sin, Christian. You've been set free from the bondage of sin. The door's open. Why'd you go back in the cell and sit down as a man in bondage? Why'd you walk into the cell that Christ opened by His precious blood? Why are you going back into sin? Stop listening to the old nature. Stop listening to that old traveler. You say, how do I kill him? Well, you kill him with the sword of the Spirit. Thrust it right in there. You have the Spirit of God. You're born of Him. You have Him in, in dwelling inside of you. You have, like I said, you have an advantage over David. He lives in here all the time. 
Listen to the Spirit of God. The sword of the Spirit. I mean, after all, the, the Holy Spirit is the, the devil's, the, the flesh's greatest enemy. Matter of fact, listen to this. The, the Bible's called the sword of the Spirit. Who wields the Word of God? The, the Spirit does. Start reading this book. Give the Spirit His sword that He can use to cut away those things that shouldn't be there. Give the Spirit of that sword by reading the Word of God and, and meditating upon it and memorizing it so the Spirit of God can cut away the traveler. Amen. Kill him. The problem is we've got to like in the traveler, ain't we? He's our old buddy. Traveler rises up, we put our arm around him, we pull him in close. Huh? We like him too much. But you know what you need to do? You need to kill him. You say, I just want to satisfy him, he's my friend. No, you need to kill him. David was defeated by this foe. Paul had to fight uh, this foe over and over again. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Uh, you can expect him to rise up against you every single day. Let me give you just a couple illustrations as we close here about this. Now, I think about the traveler. I think about Joseph too. Joseph, he was there in the household. Potiphar's wife uh, wanted, uh, her, wanted him to commit adultery with her. And she said, come lie with me. Joseph said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do that to my master, and I'm not going to do that to God. But you know what the Bible says about Potter's wife? It says she came day by day at him. Day by day, day by day. Every day he was there, she was after him. Isn't that what the traveler does? Day by day. I think about uh, a Goliath. Goliath comes out against the, the armies of Israel, and the Bible says that morning and evening he'd go out there and he'd taunt them. Morning and evening, morning and evening. We have a, a sexual thing there with Potiphar's wife. We have the traveler there trying to, to, to move in that direction. Then we have the old nature here trying to get Israel to be a bunch of cowards and not stand up. Morning and evening he'd come out. And they were cowards. They listened to the traveler. Then Delilah. Delilah uh, is after uh, Samson. Y'all remember that? It says there in the Word of God, she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Over and over again, the traveler attacks. You better be ready. You better have your loins girt about with truth. You better have your shield of faith. You better have your helmet of salvation, your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Better have that sword of the Spirit handy. If you're going to prevail, how will you fare? Don't let Him defeat you. Now, before you start flirting at work with somebody that's not your wife, you say, I'm not going to do it. Amen. Kill the traveler. When somebody tries you to go out and get drunk or do something you know you shouldn't do, kill that old traveler. Say, I ain't doing it. Or somebody tries to get you to use drugs, say, I ain't doing it. I love God too much for that stuff. Kill him. For you stall out that lie that makes you look better than what you are. Kill the old traveler who tries to get you to do it. For you steal something, kill the old traveler. Before you shack up, kill the traveler. Before you uh, commit dishonest acts, uh, dishonest acts uh, kill that traveler. Listen to the Spirit of God. And I'll close with this verse. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Amen. You know, live in the Spirit on that side. Now, th that verse is not primarily preaching against drunkenness. But it's a comparison there. When a person gets drunk with wine, what controls them? The wine does. That Spirit does. They, 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 if somebody's timid, they become bold sometimes. You ever met a drunk who always wanted to fight? Somebody's nervous can kind of get loosened up. That, that, that's what the wine does. It influences them. But that's what the Spirit of God should be doing. He should be influencing us to be bold. He should be influencing us as we kill the traveler. Let's pray.